Hi everybody, uh, welcome to uh, uh, our Cyber Essentials uh, customer journey, uh, which we're running for the second year. Um, we're really, really lucky to have Neil Firminger, who's the IASME Cyber Essentials Manager, um, who's going to tell us all about Cyber Essentials and particularly some of the uh, the, the more recent changes um, to, to that particular um, product. Uh, so as I say, we're really, really lucky to have Neil here. Um, and uh, I, I think I just really want to reiterate um, us here at the um, Southwest Cyber Resilience Centre, it's the second year that we um, qualified for uh, Cyber Essentials. And, and uh, it's, it's such a, a useful way to um, demonstrate to uh, all of our, our members and our supply chain, our commitment to cyber security. Uh, and I know Neil will, will, will have more to say about that. So Neil, I, 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 I wonder if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Um, thanks ever so much for coming uh, and uh, uh, the floor's over to you. Hi, I'm uh, Neil Firminger, Cyber Essentials Manager at IASME. Uh, I've worked for IASME for nearly five years uh, and I've been working on Cyber Essentials as either an assessor or with IASME now for eight years. Um, and uh, I am had an extensive career in IT support before that, so worked in this field for 20, 23 years, something like that now. Um, but I'm heavily involved in development of Cyber Essentials, working closely in partnership with the NCSE to, uh, on the annual developments and the question set and changes to the scheme. So, yes, I have a heavy input into Cyber Essentials. So just the man we need to talk to. Um, so Neil, I, I know before we started recording, uh, I, I said, you know, could you take us through the uh, the changes? I know they're not very recent now, um, but as I explained, because of the way our recertification um, occurred, we actually missed out on having to do the new question set. Mm. So I'd be really grateful for for the benefit of, uh, of the membership um, if you could take us through the, uh, the what those uh, changes mean to to us. Yeah, so uh, back in April, April the 24th this year, we, we released a new question set which coincided with uh, a new set of requirements or an updated set of requirements uh, alongside the NCSC. So there, there was a new document published on the NCSC website and at the same time we published a new question set. So it's now Montpellier is the, the name of that question set. That's the latest and now is the only one available now to carry out Cyber Essentials assessment. Um, so we had several areas we needed to address from the previous question set, which was Evandine, but it isn't as heavy, it's a more light touch uh, update this year. Uh, we tried to, uh, well, we gave pre-warning within the Evandine question set that there were three requirements would come in place when we introduced a new question set and they came into force in April this year. So they were the grace periods. Those grace periods were on thin client devices, the use of MFA, so that was for both administrators and users is now a requirement, and also the requirement that legacy software, or which includes operating systems, you know, could be a legacy database, legacy server operating system, legacy email system, would all have to go into what we call or define in Cyber Essentials as a subset, put it behind what we call a second hop away from the internet into a different network segment. So it wouldn't be covered under the Cyber Essentials scheme because in Cyber Essentials, all software operating systems, etc., must be supported. So we give the option that you can still, if your business still requires legacy systems, but we would like you to see you put an extra layer of protection between the in-scope networks you have in your organization and where those legacy systems are. So that is uh, with a segregation by um, VLAN or firewall device. Um, we added some clarification on an area that used to come up quite a lot about firmware and whether we're in cyber essentials we're asking for uh, all devices to be supported now we found this was getting increasingly difficult to manage because some what appear to be unsupported devices can still run supported operating systems 
and in consultation with the NCSC, it was decided that we would focus on all devices have must have the ability and must be running a supported operating system. So that could be, you know, we could have a six-year-old Dell PC, maybe no longer receiving firmware, but it may well receive firmware still through Windows 10 updates, but it can support the latest version of Windows 10 or the latest version of Windows 11. So we're concentrating on operating system support. We did a table, that's something you can dig out uh, in the uh, requirements, which is available on the NCSC, uh, some clarification of when third party devices come in. So this is contractors or an IT support company. And it's a little table there to clarify when you consider their devices in scope of your organization certificate, or it's something you deal with in your supply chain, which is a separate issue. One common area we have with this is students. And in education establishments, they either can be provided with a device. When they're provided with a device by the education establishment, that is owned by the education establishment, so that would be in scope. But the BYOD devices, and this is the one case in Cyber Essentials where BYOD accessing organizational data or services, we allow an exception for student devices. They are not covered in scope simply because with education establishments, that could be many numerous devices that change on an extremely regular basis and makes it very, very hard to track. But in all other areas, BYOD devices of your employees, etc., would be included in scope. I urge you to go and check that out. Um, it's a really useful table. We're finding, we're getting good feedback on it and it's helping clarify some really difficult scoping situations we used to have, especially around third party contractors working for an organization. But the, hopefully that table makes things a lot clearer. And if you need any support around that area, uh, we have a technical team at IASME who can be contacted on info at iasme.co.uk and they will be able to provide support on the scoping issues that uh, come up from time to time. We also did a update to device locking. So device locking was a new control we put in the year before and it was around the use of PIN numbers, etc. that came in on the Evendine question set. Under Montpellier, there's just one slight clarification area. It came to light over the 15 months we were applying that control that there are a couple of major vendors of smartphones in particular don't allow you to set the 10 lockout period, uh, 10 failed login attempts on a mobile device. So Samsung in particular, and you can't change this, their default is 15 failed login attempts so we've had to make it so if you can configure it you must set it to 10 failed login attempts but where the manufacturer sets it or the vendor sets it the device and you have no control of it we will accept the vendor's default position as being compliant with ce because there's just no way the applicant organization can change that setting uh, we've tried we've looked but there's just no way it's stuck at 15. There's another manufacturer as well that's not nowhere near as big as Samsung, but there's another one to 15 as well that I'm aware of. We also did an update within the, the new requirements that for Montpellier, an update to malware protection or your antivirus or whatever you want to call it, but your malware protection suite of tools or software, we've had to make an adjustment because there are a number of products out there now that um, focus on using artificial intelligence or behavioral scanning and don't use the old traditional method of downloading signatures on a daily update. They're monitoring patterns of behavior on people's machines to see if it looks like malicious activity to stop viruses, etc., ransomwares uh, taking place. So there was a change there. So rather than asking for a or requesting that you must apply updates on a daily basis. We've now set it, you must set your, where possible to auto update. So hopefully if you're using a signature based piece of malware protection, that uh, 
that will update on a daily basis. But for these AI behavior or behavioral scanning tools, they, they update on a less frequent basis. You know, sometimes it's weeks apart. And um, what we set now is that you must configure those to the vendor's best practices. It takes a little working out, but if you follow the vendor's best practices, you're going to get the best protection available from that, that malware protection suite of software. And then finally, we added something else, which was guidance around zero trust and guidance about asset management. But they're not new controls. They are just areas of guidance because they're two things that come up for discussion an awful lot. So if I tackle asset management first, asset management guidance has been included because good asset management underpins any plan for cyber security because you need to know which devices to apply the controls against so if you leave off seven windows seven machines let's say from your assessment you're aware of them but you're not managing them and you can't apply the controls that's important that you are understanding which devices you can put controls in. We hear horror stories all the time that people have forgotten and have been unfortunately compromised or attacked against machines they've forgotten about, perhaps sitting in a cupboard that's doing a menial job or something, or maybe running the clocking system in a manufacturing organisation or something like that. They forgot about it. And it's an unsupported operating system. Unfortunately, they could have been attacked through it. And there has been evidence of that. So if you have good asset management, you'll be in control and understanding which assets and devices and the assets, including your software, you have in your organization. And you can check on a regular basis whether they're still supported, receiving security updates. So it really underpins the whole Cyber Essentials um, journey and the controls and where you apply them to having good effective asset management another area that we needed to offer guidance on which was started to be talked about an awful lot is zero trust so we tackled this by talking to the ncsc's zero trust team uh, and they did a mapping of the zero trust model the ncsc provides uh, which is available on their website and Equally, the Cyber Essentials team, again, alongside the IASME technical team that works on a weekly basis with them, we sat alongside them and did our own mapping to the NCSE Zero Trust model. We had a meeting to discuss this, and at the outcome of that meeting was there is a direct correlation between Zero Trust, the NCSE Zero Trust model, and Cyber Essentials controls. So there are six areas that are identified in the NCSC's Zero Trust model. The only one that is not covered by uh, Cyber Essentials is logging and monitoring. That's an additional thing inside the Zero Trust model. Now, it's not something we're planning to put into Cyber Essentials in the immediate future. I can't say it might not happen in the future because who knows what we need to do in the future and you know technology changes etc but the other five controls of cyber essentials so that is your firewalls and boundaries your secure configuration your security update management your user accounts and access control and your malware protection are all elements of that ncsc zero trust model so if you're saying and a, somebody is an applicant comes to us and says we don't need to apply the controls, but we are doing zero trust. We're actually saying, uh, if you're doing zero trust, you should be doing all the controls, the cyber essentials. They're all there. You can go through it. You need to identify your boundaries. You need to be using MFA. You must be using MFA to have a very effective zero trust model. That's an absolute given. But you need to understand all the devices in the organization. You need to have some protection on the devices. You need to have control over the identity and user accounts in there. And you must be patching and updating all your devices on a regular basis to have an effective zero trust model. So there's a direct correlation. And that made us very happy because it helps us answer that, but also encourages people to apply the zero trust, the 
controls and the zero trust model at the same time. So it's a very effective model. Just a, a point on that. So those are the changes that came in this year. At this current time, there are no planned changes for 2024. We are going to have a period of feedback on the scheme. We introduced three sets of changes over a 24 month period. And we felt there was a period of reflection needs to take place. So we're looking at how we can improve the question set at the moment to put, add more guidance, add the requirements into it. And hopefully that will make the applicant journey better as time goes on. So we're going to have a reflective period and gain, gain a lot of feedback um, over the next 12 or so months that we can feed back into the scheme and hopefully make further improvements. That's the general update. I hope that was enough. <laughs> yeah, no, they, 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 there's loads of, of, of really useful stuff there, Neil. And, and I'm really grateful that you shared it with us. That, but I, I think what it does, it, it shows um, that Cyber Essentials it, it is, is, it maintains its currency. Um, I, I think it's applied in a very sensible way. And I certainly like the idea how, you know, by, by taking one sort of one step removed, you can use, still use old systems and, and, and old machines because obviously cost is always a, 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 a real issue. Um, and yeah. I think it also, also shows, and perhaps I'm asking too many questions here, but I'll, I'll, I'll carry on if you don't mind. Um, yeah. We can always come back to them. Um, and it also shows um, uh, that you're there to help. And certainly that's my experience um, when I've gone through Cyber Essentials for the Southwest Cyber Resilience Center. Um, that actually it's not about, you know, um, passing, passing an exam per se. Uh, clearly, you, you've got to cover the subject material, but it's, you, you, you guys are really helpful in, in giving the feedback um, when you go through. So I don't know if I've perhaps talked too much there and uh, whether you could comment on it. No, that, that, Ross, that very much fits in with the ethos we have and the way we think about cyber essentials. There are two elements to it. One, hopefully, that you gain a certification because that shows you put all five controls in. But ultimately, I I myself get a great deal of satisfaction out of educating people and showing that there's some really, I won't say simple, but I will say effective and relatively easy to implement controls that can have a dramatic effect on improving your cybersecurity in any, any organization. And that's where... When we're looking at making changes to cyber essentials, we're monitoring the trends. We're using the evidence the NCSE sees. We react to the technology changes that are out there. But we're looking for those simple measures that help to protect against attacks that come from the internet. That is what cyber essentials is about. So when you mentioned the legacy systems just now, when you're, so if you have a legacy system within your network, and it's directly connected onto a network that's directly connected to the internet, okay, that exposes that system to vulnerabilities because immediately from the time it goes unsupported, it has more vulnerabilities exposed. It will never get updated or patched. We saw this with products such as Windows XP when there was lots of rumors of how many vulnerabilities it was when it went to end of life many years ago. But it was continually attacked and it was always let seen as a doorway. But if you put it behind that second hop, as we call it, a second layer of protection, an additional firewall or a VLAN, that's a far more complex attack that needs to take place, which is outside the remit of what Cyber Essentials uh, attack vectors are. So it just makes it a far more complex attack to move it away and not expose that system to the internet. So if you are using it for data, maybe personal information data, etc. that's covered by data protection, UK data protection regulations and the GDPR, put it in a second hop, take it away from the internet, it's a harder attack to, um, to take place. So, because Cyber Essentials is interested in that, those attacks directly come from the internet, the easy, simple, uh, freely available using tools that are freely available effectively to carry out um but just remember they're not the targeted attacks we're looking at the untargeted attacks in cyber essentials and 
those untargeted attacks probably account for 95 percent of all cyber attacks that are out there um and they're often carried out by low skilled people that means they're not hackers they're not part of activist groups or state actors so we mean you know organizations that are doing it for massive commercial gain etc you know like the old one the old anonymous group who used to do it who's no longer but there are plenty of other groups out there that do it for a more complex attacks and we've seen a few of those in the news recently and but the basic cyber essentials will help to prevent 80 percent of cyber attacks so it's really important that these controls are in place and update yeah. and i have to say updated on a regular basis to uh monitor the trend just keep in touch with the trends that are out there that's why we introduced multi-factor authentication to protect cloud services yeah and, and i know obviously how, how important it is for for um to fa or multi-factor authentication to, to be used and i know we we always um really encourage people we speak to to, to do exactly that um so I, I think we've we've covered um all the the changes in, in cyber centers yeah. i think that was really useful neil um I, I suppose what we also need to do is to address perhaps for some of our members who haven't been certified before um just perhaps go back a little bit um and, and not in too much detail but just a little bit back to sort of basics as, as to why you should um first of all you know um go through the the certification process and, and the benefits and, and and perhaps just a little bit about the, uh, the, the 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 actual financial costs of it and, and if we could just sort of um, round off if you wouldn't mind again this me asking multi questions um ha have a look at the insurance as well because i think that's really really important and and, and often um uh, uh, kind of almost glossed over by people yes that's right yeah uh, so there, there's the basic premises premise of uh, cyber essentials is to to apply preventative measures that will stop 80% of cyber attacks or common cyber attacks let's put it that way so they are simple measures you know and they cover five control areas uh, and they've been well thought out and it's been outlined for nine years what those five, those five control areas are and they're part of a wider piece of work by the NCSC called the 10 Steps to Cybersecurity. So there are approximately 70 plus controls within the 10 steps. And these are five of those controls. So they are to uh, put protections on your physical and software firewalls. So you have software firewalls also in your operating systems. To uh, element a secure configuration so that's removing unrequired software unrequired accounts etc and device locking on your devices then we talk about uh, security update management so this is where we want all high and critical ranked uh, patches to be applied within a set period of time and that period of time is 14 days of release by the vendor now that is Often difficult for companies to achieve, but it can be achieved and is can be more automated now by applying just turning on auto updating from the manufacturers. I think we've all seen that we get lots of updates on smartphones and tablets. They are there normally for a purpose and it's normally for security updates. And we get a lot more than we used to. I suggest don't ever ignore those updates. They normally need to be applied. There's a very good reason they've been released. And then we also talk about in security update management about not having those legacy systems or unsupported systems within the, the scope of cyber essentials and making sure you're protecting them because they no longer get those updates. And then we talk about the use of user accounts. So these are the accounts you use your day to day work, but keeping them separate, those permissions on those user accounts or they're known as privileges on those accounts separate to those ones that can be more powerful can install a piece of software or they can make configuration changes like create new user accounts or something like that on devices um, you need to use separate accounts there because that's an attack that is used quite a lot 
in ransomware where they hope when they get you to click on the link they're hoping you have administrator privileges on your account and install some encryption software in the background and then your device is encrypted if it flashes up that you have to put an alternative username to install that software in there that should be a warning to everybody why is something to trying to ask me for administrator details here and that's why we talk about this in cyber essentials because it's effective against the common ransomwares out there and there's more and more evidence building on that um, that element and then finally the fifth area control is malware protection this is what's formerly used to be known as antivirus software but it moves on malware is a more generic term for a far wider range of nasty pieces of software that can come on your machines and cause you trouble in your organizations so having an active supported and regularly updating piece of malware protection software is the fifth control in cyber essentials so why cyber essentials so it is a protective it offers you protective uh, measures in your organization because it's better to put those protections in place than to have to deal with a cyber attack. Nobody wants to go through that process. I've worked with companies in the past that have gone through that and it's not a very pleasant experience. It's certainly not for the applicant organizations. It's certainly not for the people who have to clear it up. They are quite difficult sometimes. There's a lot of work involved and they can get quite messy. But also, the advantage of having this is you can demonstrate that you have adopted good basic cybersecurity measures within your organization. And this helps to protect supply chains. This may be your own supply chain or a supply chain the organizations uh, are part of. So we see that increasingly, certainly in government contracts, but we're seeing the requirement in a lot more local authority contracts. We have seen it in a number of private companies as well. We now see that we've done a lot of work with St. James's Place over the last uh, 18 months or so. They have adopted it as a supply chain measurement tool. So they asked all their I independent financial advisors if they were not using equipment supplies by St James's Place they had to gain cyber essentials to use their own kit and they actually went a layer further so there's two levels to cyber essentials so there's the verified self-assessment but in St James's Place they asked for the audited version which is called CE plus now CE plus is where an assessor will come and actually run some tools etc to make sure you have uh, and tools and checks on your devices to make sure you are applying the cyber essentials controls correctly so there's those two layers there so they give different levels of assurance but if you follow it all the way through correctly it will help to protect your organizations so if it means you can demonstrate to these organizations it can help develop business growth as well that's something else we see a lot of companies who get cyber essentials it can aid, help you get cyber insurance etc now talking about cyber insurance cyber essentials contains an element of cyber uh, cyber insurance we keep getting insurance and assurance mixed up <laughs> two very similar words that i use in my uh, day to day work so cyber insurance in cyber essentials if you uh, have a turnover less than 20 million pounds in your organization you are uh, eligible to have included in the price of assessment um 25,000 pounds worth of cover for recovery from a cyber incident so that will give you some help after it both from a technical perspective and I understand legal perspective. So there, there's, there's that element of cyber insurance included, which is included in the cost of it. So the basic cost, so the rate, the range of costs for cyber essentials, that's the verified self-assessment where you fill out a questionnaire and then an assessor goes through your answers. That range is 300 to 500 pounds, depending on the, size of your organization so 300 to 500 pounds plus fat must always say that 
And then there we have the C Cyber Essentials Plus. So there is a cost for the actual certification part, but there's a larger part, which is the consultation period for the audit, audit to be carried out. Okay, and the average cost of that is somewhere between fifteen hundred to two hundred two two and a half thousand pounds. Sorry, but it is dependent on the size of your organisation and how many devices need to be sampled and the time it will take an audit to carry out that work. But that you know that's a good level of assurance and treat it. And I always say this with Cyber Essentials: treat it as an annual review. Uh, of your cyber security posture and it's a really really good exercise if you don't know where to begin with this journey on cyber essentials the first place to look at is on the iasme website we have the called uh, we have a website called get ready for cyber essentials and this is the cyber essentials get readiness tool so this is a tool that prepares you for going through the process of achieving cyber essentials. And in that tool, you're going to identify areas where you may have weaknesses or we call gaps within your um, organization where you need to make improvements to gain the certificate at the end of the day. You get a nice little report that just shows you what you need to do. There's lots of guidance, clear guidance written there with the team here at IASME that you can plug in and get more information about it. And that's one area we will be expanding on. And as later this year, early into next year, we will be publishing a, or oh, making available, a public Cyber Essentials knowledge base where there'll be many, many articles. There'll be information about unsupported systems, when operating systems go end of life, lots of videos, Lots of frequently asked questions from sessions like we have today. Uh, there's going to be loads more Cyber Essentials advice out there freely available to help applicants gain certification and improve their cyber security posture. That's the most important thing is that improvement you get from doing this and the protections you put in place. No, that, that, that's fantastic. No, thank you so much. Um, and, and I, I think really that, that's the thing isn't it? it it is all about protection and you are an organization that will help people through the process so really there's no reason to be daunted by it um because there, there's there's loads and loads of help both either through the website um and through your own help desk um to, to get people through that process let's not forget though we've also got a network of 300 certifying bodies throughout the uk of which uh, a number of them are trusted partners with yourself. And also something new that was launched this year, we now have the uh, Cyber Advisor, Cyber Essentials Advisors out there. So we have uh, at the latest count 50 of those and 50 organisations um, that now can offer advice and implementation services to put the controls in place. That was a new scheme launched uh, by the NCSC, which I asked me run on their behalf. And that's growing very fast and a lot of uptake in that as well. So there is more and more advice out there from so about cyber essentials besides just coming to IASME. Yeah. yeah, sure. And obviously, you know, if anybody wants to get hold of one of the, we now call our trusted partners, they're now cyber essentials partners. Um, yeah. But they, they can contact them through us. But the, um, the, the, the um, uh, um, cyber advisors, um, uh, how how would um, if somebody wanted to contact one of those how, how would they do that again there's a um, directory of them I believe on our website you can come there whether you're looking for a certifying body or you are looking for a cyber advisor they can be located in, on a database on our website fantastic thank you so much um, I, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for the time that you spent with us this afternoon but I know you're very passionate about this and it comes across uh, the, the way you, <laughs> you talk about a subject and it's, it's so interesting um yeah. but as i say thank you so much for the time you spent today uh, and uh, i look forward to uh, next year's um uh, uh, update if, if 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 we have one yeah oh yeah very much looking forward to it yeah <laughs> thanks thanks again Neil. thank you Ross. cheers bye, -bye. bye.